Any views expressed in this podcast are based on information available at the time and are subject to change without notice. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. This is our final podcast for the year. We're going to talk about bonds. I'm with Paul Gardner. We're going to talk about why investors hate bonds and are bonds actually still a relevant part of your portfolio, and then just critique and analyze the year-end performance in our bond portfolio. But before I get started, happy holidays to everyone. And and Paul, did you see the new Spider-Man movie? No, my son did. I am going to see it probably next week. I went to the drive-in theater oh, in Oakville. With the so kids. no COVID. So it it's good. good. No COVID issues. Then. No, no, no COVID. It, no, no. It, it was good? It was very good. Okay, good. It, it was good. very good. Well, okay. So let's just get into it. Uh, one of the things that we keep hearing from clients, investors, uh, and people across the industry is, I hate bonds. The return profile is very low. Interest rates are, are, are near all-time lows. Uh, real rates are negative, meaning after inflation and taxes, uh, with inflation running at 4.5% this year. And there's just a record amount of debt out there in the corporate sector or by governments. Why do I own bonds so those are all negative reasons yeah, to for own sure. bonds but what, sure. you being in the bond space yeah. your whole career yeah. what are your what are your thoughts on bonds so so in a way i technically don't disagree with everything you said i mean it's a hard go right now to be in the bond market uh we've never seen this before and you know it's an obvious answer it's because rates are so low and now rates are slightly backing up. So, of course, that's n very big negative headwinds for bonds. And considering the yield you're about to get, it's not, even, it's not good from that perspective. But there's a couple things that you kind of have to go through and really understand why bonds are important uh, for a client. Uh, not necessarily from the investment side, but more from the financial planning side. So let's, but let's first kind of unwrap the investment side. Sure. Spe specifically talking about investment. Um, it's right now still not a great place to go. Now, now being in the bond market, we've actually had a positive return this year, unlike the index, which had negative, and there's several reasons for that. Um, well, one, uh, the, yeah. The, sorry. Go the, ahead. One, the, the bond index, the broader index, is more interest rate sensitive. Related, yeah. So, And we could kind of bob and weave out of that. But really, let's talk about the market itself before sure. we talk about the, the portfolio that we manage. So... The bond market is dealing, like I said, with higher interest rates, slightly higher interest rates from, say, this summer. Uh, as well, we have the Federal Reserve that's going to be tightening. We're, for that matter, all the global central banks are going to start tightening their, their monetary policy because we know that there's a ton of growth coming out of the world economy after and during the pandemic. You know, one of the classic, you know, I don't mean to tangent, but one of the classic mistakes and they i don't even blame them they thought we were going to go into a deep recession depression during the pandemic when everyone's stuck at home but actually the ha the opposite happened is that everyone got free money and they couldn't spend it so it just made of course this supply chain issue even more pronounced because everyone was ordering online and of course we couldn't handle yeah, the, the just through the only recession in history that more money, more money yeah was saved. yeah exactly and the savings rate skyrocketed both in, in everywhere, but in Canada specifically, it went up to um, 7%, 8%. And I think in the U.S. it went up to 12%, yeah. if I'm correct. So that's tremendously bullish for the growth of the economy. And that's, of course, why the central banks are dealing with it. Now, of course, let's talk about the elephant in the room is inflation. Yeah, yeah. So this just putting in this in the context of bonds, I'm buying individual bonds or I own a bond portfolio. I'm lucky to squeeze out a 2% rate of return or 2.5% rate of return, and not even in a linear way as rates can bounce up or down. Why am I doing this again if inflation's at 45 and, and I'm and taxable? And it's very hard to answer in a positive way why you should do it. Because from the investment side, the, there really is a hard, it's very hard to own bonds when your, your real rates of return are negative three, negative four. So that means... You buy the bond, just like you said, you get 3%, but then inflation erodes 4 or 5% away, so you're actually down the next year even more. So it's about capital preservation. So, so that's, that's the answer is now let's put the – so first of all, from an investment side, it's not great. There is a threat of higher interest rates, which we, we are kind of mixed at Avenue about the, our opinion of how much higher it goes. But you have to at least acknowledge it, and then you have inflation in the way. So what we did from an investment side is we 
we proactively in January of this year, we saw this coming in a sense, and we bought a large position of uh, real return inflation index bonds. Yeah, so why don't you tell the audience, yeah. how does a real return bond work? And, I, and I'll just kind of qualify. When I say a large, rate, large position is we generally in our clients' portfolio, bond portfolios, they're around 15% weighting, which is a very large yeah. position. We can't go 100% weight on these things because no, no. so, so. there's, there's, there's risk return and there's, there's, you, know, there's, you have to be balanced. So real return bonds yeah. protect you against inflation, yeah. but, so but take us through the mechanics. So what it is, is, is that as your CPI or as your inflation index, and I'm not talking X food and energy, I'm not talking any other gauge than what we see the head, what is called the headline number. And the headline number in the, in Canada right now is about 4.8%. So you take your bonds, which actually your inflation index bonds, they yield you minus 1%. So you're losing money there because it's a negative yield but you get compensated by the inflation rate, which is 5%. So net, you're probably earning more or less around uh, 4% or 3.5%. So, so it's a great hedge on inflation. Inflation, yeah. As a portion of your portfolio. Yes, not you all of it. You don't put all of it in real return. E even, what if you're wrong? Even if you're wrong, you're not, unless there's deflation, you're not going to get killed. But from, from the prudent man rule is... You have a when you have some conviction. You don't put a hundred. You don't put a hundred dollars on black, you know, or red. You in a roulette table. You 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 put a measured are bet on there. Are you comparing bonds uh, investing to roulette? Yeah. Not I'm, really. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fire just, you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so but, but we do have a position there, and then of course um, the other negative, which you haven't talked about, which is important to understand, is credit bonds, corporate bonds. Yeah. They they give you let's say on average one and a half percent above government of Canada. That sounds pretty good, but the problem is the absolute levels are so low. At say if government bonds are at one percent, and you get one and a half percent, that's two and a half percent to lend to a corporation. Which is a whole, entirely different. That's a whole game. yeah exactly. How long are you lending? Right. Uh, What's the credit worthiness? What is the credit worthiness? Are you in high yield or are you investment grade? What happens when you go through the next? So recession? I can only tell you what we have done is normally historically our credit exposure to investment grade bonds mostly. We do sometimes have high yield bonds, but, but not mostly in this environment. not in this environment. But mostly it's investment grade. But we used to hold roughly about 60% in the portfolio of investment grade bonds. We're down to about 25%. And the reason is, is we just believe there's little to no value owning. No, we have to own something. So we own conservative investment grade credits or we own energy credits. When we, we had bought energy credits in the summer when, when oil had fallen off and we found the credits were very cheap. And just to tangent again, if you own energy credit bonds, they're fundamentally, they've been in the best shape they've ever been because what have we seen in the oil patch? Yeah. We've seen, you know, higher oil prices, lower costs, and their free cash flow of the company has just exploded. Whether it's CNQ or Synovus, they have, are paying down their debt so quickly that it makes um, in a nice bet to own um, oil-based investment-grade bonds. So but even then, the absolute level is still not good. And then when you even go to the high yield market where you can earn maybe 4%. That's crazy talk yeah, because- well, well, Okay, let's touch on that for a second. Why would anyone go to the high yield market? Yes, you're getting, because central banks have suppressed rates. Yeah. And they bought, remember, they were buying yeah, high and, yield and, as well. And they were a net With quantitative of, of, easing, high, yeah. uh, of high yield yeah. debt. Right. You're suppressing rates and you've, you've caused this disallocation of capital, meaning money's come into the high yield bond market, right. Right. trying to get that extra yield, but to be, nice about it you're, you're you're buying crappy credits and then what happens when you go through the next recession and and the company's right. cash flows contract so this is you're more of compensated. right so i would agree with you and on an absolute and relative i think it's a no-go high yield i don't think it has any value whatsoever but more importantly you said why own these quote-unquote crappy credits yeah. some of them are good credits just high yield but yes. the problem is from my perspective the risk return is so skewed against you because, okay, let's, let's say you buy a high yield, which is a double B and you get 5%. So to tell the audience, what, what is, what is a double B? So investment grade is, is what? Investment grade is 
kind of well i don't won't go into the metrics of why investment grade is better but i can tell you that, like like the loblaws of the world the bells of the world roger actually roger is not investment grade but the the bell um um you know the the utilities the pipelines are all investment grade because so, you have a hard asset there or you have a business that doesn't go through a secular a secular downturn, downturn yeah. thanks but then you have the high yield market which is you know, like just you're, they're over labored, whether whatever business they're in. And at one point they're going to get caught, whether it's a mining company or whether it's a tel a, um, a technology company that has added on a massive amount of debt. It's just not worth it from a relative or absolute because your risk reward is so bad. And then when you put on inflation on top of that, you're actually still losing money and you're giving the, this company money for at least five years. So it's kind of like if I gave you, if I lent you money, yeah. I know you're going to pay me back next you're year. You're never lending me money. But if I lend money to yeah. my neighbor, yeah. maybe he won't. He's less credit worthy. Right, he won't pay me back. right. So, so why like would you do it? And, 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 and he sells you on the idea that, oh, I, I'm going to give you three extra percent above the normal rates. Which is, sounds great. Which sounds great until your neighbor doesn't pay. Yeah, right. and and but you're not being compensated. No. If you were to get ten percent, maybe then you could say you could do it in your head, saying, "Will my neighbor pay it back, or do I take a risk?" You, at least you're being compensated by that yield. But at least in high yield market, there is no compensation. So let's. Or sorry, there's less compensation. So let's bring this back into focus. Okay, so we outperformed this year, uh, the bond market. Part of that is because we've had some exposure to real return bonds, yeah. which do better in an inflationary yeah. environment, but also because we're, we're less interest rate sensitive in the portfolio. Right. Do you want to- so, so why we, we did better than the index yeah. this year is just one reason is that we got defensive really quickly. And what we mean by that is that we shortened our duration. You know, remember, rates had backed up aggressively in the first half of the year. So dur duration yeah. just Sorry, means, and immature, yeah. yeah duration go, just go, means yeah. how interest rate sensitive your portfolio right. is. So the longer right. you lend money out, the more interest rate sensitive Movement, and movement, movement of prices. Yeah. And so exactly it is that we lowered our maturity or lowered our duration to make it a less risky. We, as I mentioned, we gave less exposure to um, credit. Uh, and that, that didn't help or hurt us, but we're, we're waiting for a day that that credit market explodes higher, meaning it sells off and it's going to happen. It might not happen in the next six months, but it's going to happen in the next year, year and a half. So we're waiting for that. And then thirdly, we just loaded the portfolio with government of Canada and provincial debt. But, and finally we have that big position in inflation index bonds, just to kind of give you a proxy of how it's performed over the year. The inflation index bonds that we bought in January, uh, year to date, they're up around um, 2%, which is not great, but your comparable, which is your long duration bonds, because they're the same maturity, they're down 6% or 8%, depending on what index you look at. So there's an outperformance of at least 10, 8% okay, there. So we lowered our du uh, duration. We had exposure to real return bonds. We're not in the high yield uh, space because you're not being compensated for the risk that you're taking. And this whole picking on bonds, let's talk about yeah. why it's still relevant because right. the market has forgot exactly. that bonds are relevant, although it's tough to make the investment argument. So do you want to talk bonds. about your experience sure. with clients and like, cause yeah, you get, yeah, you yeah. get pushback a lot, you know, yeah, with, well, so, and maybe with you explaining it, then I can kind sure. of embellish a little more onto that comment. Sure. So one is there will be a day when the equity markets go down and not only will they go down, they'll go down a lot. So owning bonds is not only about capital preservation, but having something that doesn't is not as volatile as stocks that, that doesn't go down as much. And, and yes, no one wants to earn 2% or 2.5% or be flat or have that exposure to bonds. But when the market drops 30%, and you're retired, so yeah, let's and that's the key too. Retired, yeah, let's say you're retired, and and or it just doesn't suit your risk profile as a whole. The bonds help damper that volatility. And then number two, you actually, if you need money out of the portfolio, you don't have to use your stock portfolio as a bank account, and you can t you can uh, have that ex extra liquidity from the bond market to help fund your retirement. Right, so, and that's so it's about risk management. Yeah, it really is. It's almost like I can even compare it to, to like you're going to your doctor and he tells you you either have to adjust your diet or you have to take this medicine to make your knee better or you have to do rehab and you hate it. 
Well, guess what? You're going to have to do it if you want to perform better or, or feel better, but it takes a little bit of work. So the same thing with bonds is that it might not feel owning it or going down, you know, consuming it, it might not feel good, but when the market, the equity market drops 30%, you'll probably be very happy that you were only down 2% in the, in the bond market. And then you get to reload in the it equity. It doesn't have to be static. No, it doesn't have to be static. You can move money into bonds and then you can sell bonds and buy stocks, or you can have a portion of your of a number of years of living experience, uh, expenses in the bond market and, and provide liquidity to, uh, to right. clients during retirement. Or maybe the client is just not comfortable being in stocks. I know we have hedges on in our equity yeah. portfolio to help in a big drawdown, yeah. so you don't need to have to be But there's a natural inclination for capital preservation and for balance. And whether you like it or not as a client and whether we like it or not as an investor, we still have to accept the instrument or the 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 sector or whatever you want to call it bonds as an instrument that everyone in in most situations needs to own it uh now now if you're young and you're you know you have no care you probably can avoid it but when we get to financial planning models you have to have some stability because in your forecast you have to say there will be one day that the equity market is down 30 percent and the question is how where do you run your lifestyle yeah, so that's yeah. why you need that pocket yeah, well, of money yeah where's the money coming from can you even live with the market if it drops 30 40 percent how does that affect you psychologically or there have been time periods where the equity market's gone down you know 40 percent and stayed there for a yeah. decade and I'll give you an out, uh, I'll shift it a little bit, is there is a scenario. I, I don't put a high amount of... Um, Are you going the deflation? Yeah, right yeah, okay. yeah. There is a scenario where two, two things... Uh, first of all, you've had a quote-unquote bad year in the bond market this year. Um, not really on our, our accounts for us, for us but, but it is a bad market. So generally, the next year is generally better just because what does that mean if you have a bad year in bond market? Rates have already gone up. So there is a theory, there is a case that you can make the claim that once, and we're starting to see it a little bit, so I'm not, not I don't have full conviction, but we're starting to talk more about it, that the economy is slowing down. So are you, and also, which is equally important, if you asked me three months ago, I would say the central banks have been pretty clear that they won't raise rates until, uh, until mid next year, and now the language and the tone has changed, yeah. and you even saw the Bank of England raise as well right. so if there is rate hikes on the horizon which there probably will be because inflation's running higher you have to it, dip that in the butt you, you know one yeah you could you know part of our thesis is maybe you raise rates higher than you should and and then you throw us back into recession and and then rates collapse again right. which would be good for, for bond yeah so yeah. so there's that case where just like you said that in the future, you know, everyone's focused on inflation. As, as a bond manager, we focus on the future and not on the present. And, and bond managers already are telling you, when you look at the, the curve flattening so aggressively, the bond managers of the world, and we believe uh, that they're the smart guys in the room, they're already projecting that there's the economy is going into recession. You're not the smartest guy <laughs> in the room. Well, you uh, hope. But you, um, um, you... you you start projecting that we are facing a slowdown in the next six to 12 months and that the bond market will start pricing it in, i.e. the flattening. There is also another possibility that things get so bad in the equity markets and in the economy a year from now that the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Canada are going to have to reverse course, lower rates, yeah. quantitative ease, and actually put rates negative. So if rates are negative, then of course your bond portfolio We'll have a good year th next year yeah, or the following year. That's so, a whole separate yeah. discussion. Now, I would never, I'm still not there yet, and we're still talking about it. We are not even really positioned for it, but there could be a day where we will, will in the next, say, six months. But right now, uh, it's more neutral and just, you remember, you're getting, we're getting compensated a portion of our portfolio with higher inflation. And that we know the inflation rate, it takes a while for it to tick lower. So going, in, going into, the U.S. election or the midterm election next year with inflation running as high as it is. No wonder the central bank's tone has changed about wanting to raise rates or there being several rate hikes next year. But when you look at the actual, you know, the amount of margin debt out there or how indebted 
uh, corporations, individuals, society is as a whole, if, if the economy can't absorb that, you're just going to end up throwing going right back into recession. And yeah, that's, right that's a really good point that I didn't mention, and it's worth mentioning, is that you're, you've got to really look through this inflation cycle, but at the same time, there is so much debt out there that that's naturally slows down the economy. Like the multiplier effect, if people are familiar with, when you lend, classically, when you lend a dollar to a corporation or to a person, he creates, back in the day, he would create 1.8 times that in economic activity. Now that's gone down to effectively, theoretically, or what, what I've read is about 0.6, and it's collapsing every year. So whatever you expand in the debt market will reverse course and bite you in the sense that it's not expanding the economy, it's actually contracting the economy yeah. because it's slowing down people, and, and I don't have to tell anyone this, whether by government, by private, by corporation, we're all overloaded with debt because guess what? Debt was cheap and debt was on sale, so everyone consumed it. But eventually, the problem with debt is you gotta pay back daddies one day, you know, and, and, uh, and that's gonna happen over the next several years, if not decades, and that's gonna create a slow growth environment so once again i'm kind of i'm contradicting myself at the beginning of the talk but but it, it comes back to everything that we talk about in our investment meetings which is try to come up the middle sorry for the uh sports reference but hit signals don't operate in extremes right. you know don't be all equities and not have hedges on or don't be you know overweight right. or don't be in cash so the uh, the offset too is everyone's in cash yeah, so cash tell i really need to understand why and uh, i would ask that person so you're in cash, you're earning absolutely nothing, and as you've been now, this has been going on for two years. What are you going to do with it? I think so, I think you yeah. just raised twenty million dollars yeah. for us on so this podcast. Yeah. If you want to open yeah. up an account, yes. Paul Gardner is available over the holiday. Yes, just call break. the one eight hundred number. I certainly won't. Do. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but it, look, yeah. j just rational. So whether it's the bond portfolio or or on the equity side, position yourself for in both portfolios, equity and bonds. Have things that do better in an inflationary environment. Whether it's on the equity side, you know, real estate, infrastructure, commodity cyclicals, uh, or real return bonds in the bond portfolio, but also have things that will do better in a deflationary type environment. Whether it's bonds in general or having the hedges on and the equity. And portfolio. I will say one thing to the audience: if there's people listening, um, there's one instrument that'll get really hurt if we go into a deflation and if they cut rates and they go negative, and that's preferreds. Oh, so right, not oh, we're nice. we're never really into preferreds because we have an um, the bond doesn't the bond dynamic doesn't give you a great because there are always resets right and this so this language this conversation is to the retail client that that the advisor or whoever they land themselves yeah, on preferreds that that is so terrible don't even get me an attention yeah, yeah. but the whole retail but talk a little bit sure. about the preferreds okay, so, and then we don't have to keep going on okay, this but, but we can talk a okay, minute so on it because because that's our this. competition in a sense right in a sense. But these retail brokerages or brokers have sold preferred shares as a fixed income substitute, which it is not. A preferred share is not, there's no claim on the assets. You're not, it is not, although it has fixed income yeah. characteristics. It has it's the, not, and the volatility. It's not fixed, in, uh, fixed income. They're extremely illiquid. A lot of the banks have done these new, new issues. And they also have these, you know, sexy features, so to speak, which are rate resets. So, if interest rates go higher or lower, your dividend is affected accordingly. Or if there's a new issue with more favorable terms, it affects the resale. But it, the moral of the story is, it's not a bond, number one. It's not true fixed income. Right. Two, interest rate moves and liquidity can absolutely crush it. Yeah, and let's just quantify that. So in the last down big market, when rates dropped, I'm talking you can even go back to 08, 09, but you can even use the excuse of, of 20, is that bonds, depending on what your maturity was, it was either up 2% or down 2% during the collapse uh, in the pandemic. Well, preferreds went down 30% or 25%. Yeah, so so, so that's, that? yes. that's, that equates a stock market collapse. So why are you overloading you know, even or, though because you're driven by tax, that's the other in thing. In the worst case yeah. scenario, the business goes through restructuring. Yeah. When you're going through restructuring, it's hard enough to get the bondholders 
yeah. to get paid. Oh yeah, the preferred. You're behind. Not you're behind paid. us. So 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 I won't say preferreds are not a legitimate strategy. They certainly are. But if as you an, as, as an equity, portfolio. yeah, yeah, kinda, or as a hybrid, maybe that you put ten or fifteen percent in. But as a bond strategy, it is not a relevant strategy because the volatility is so high. I, I, I kind of disagree with you. Like so, okay. So what would you rather own? TD Bank or Royal Bank, or would you rather true. own yeah, Royal yeah, Bank preferred yeah. shares? Would yeah, I'd rather own the common share. I'd rather own less of the common and more of the bonds, and then I get better returns versus owning more of the preferreds because it's still a, a rate, yeah. like it's a yeah. fixed rate of return in a yeah. sense. So, and then you're dealing with the interest rate market. And the problem is everyone keeps thinking, this is the classic mistake of most retail investors, everyone keeps thinking rates are going higher. And even today, I'd be a fool not to say rates, rates are going to go higher. But the problem is, they in six to nine them. months, you, you have a tipping start. tipping effect, yeah. and it just crashes down. And then you're back into, I have no diversification from the equity market because the preferred market kind of runs as well. And the central banks are now liquefying everything. So you're going to get hurt in preferreds. Enough about the preferreds, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out. No, but and do because they're so illiquid and small, the preferred share market is really... Yeah, small, and that's a, big, that's a big problem. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. Preferreds. It's hard to buy it. Yeah. We sparingly buy it here and there, but anyway. That's, but anyways, yeah. I don't know. Anything else you want to touch on? I like your, you know, I like your sweater. What is you. that? It's very uh, purple. Yeah. Very purple. Well, where's your dress shirt? Today's office. You're, yeah, a you're in off. vacation mode. Yes, yes. I am on vacation next week, so um, uh, or tomorrow. Um, so, the other, I guess just projection for next year is, um, you know, we do think short-term rates are going to go up. We yeah. think the Bank of Canada is going to raise rates. Um, we think probably halfway through, uh, you'll start seeing the economy stall out. And we're not there yet on inflation, but we do think inflation's topish, although we have no proof of it. And, and I wouldn't bet a large sum of money on it. Maybe in six months, if we get a better feel for it, then we would start taking off our inflation index bonds. But right now, we're very happy owning th these type of instruments to get us by. It really is, from the bond market, we're just in defensive mode right now until we find an opening where we go, hey, this is a great rate of return. That comes from credit, from duration, and from just overall interest what, rate risk. What, what happened to the days when we could do our credit work and you could buy a bond that gave you an equity yeah. like rate of return well, with less risk? Yeah. You'd go through your, do all your credit work and say, I'll get my 8% rate of return yeah. as an equity and that's, with less and risk. And that's the you problem. Can't do it. It's all being taken and away that's the problem it. because at an absolute level, rates are too low. So that forced the high yield market down. Yeah. And on a relative perspective, there's so much liquidity in this system that high yield spreads between government cannas and high yield have compressed so much that there's no value in owning that stuff. So in the end, I think the best message is just kind of um, have, have some exposure to bonds. Don't be kind of aggressive with it and just accept what you get and think of it as a capital preservation strategy for the moment. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, absolutely. And each individual uh, situation, client profile is unique. So those clients that listen to this and go, oh my God, I don't own bonds. Reach out to us. Yeah, and we get yeah. as as always, but there's there's a reason for it. But uh, happy holidays to this and is happy New Year. Happy yeah, happy holidays, happy New Year. This is kind of fun doing this. And let's hope twenty twenty two is a much better it's, year. It's more, I find that when we do this, it's uh, it's more organic. We're kind of all over the yeah. place because we're not. It's not scripted, but uh, maybe next time I'll pick a fight with you. Yeah. Okay. Like it our sounds good. <laughs> okay. okay. Happy New Year, everybody. Okay. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. You can find us on avenueinvestment.com where you can learn more about the topics discussed today on our blog or subscribe for updates to our content. You can also follow us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.